Hi, welcome to Digging for Truth, sponsored by the Associates for Biblical Research, located in Lancaster County, Pennsylvania. I'm your co-host, Henry Smith, and today on Digging for Truth, we're going to be talking about one of the most powerful kings of the Northern Kingdom, Israel, King Omri. Again, Brian Wendell, ABR staff member and pastor, has joined us to do what we call an archaeological biography. Well, Brian, welcome back to Digging for Truth. Thanks, Henry. It's always an honor and a pleasure to come and talk to you. You know, my kids, it's funny, my kids get a little yes. weary of me always talking about archaeology, and so it's nice to have this outlet where I can come and talk about all the archaeological evidence for people's lives in Scripture. Yeah, you could you could uh, reprogram their tablets and phones so that they're forced to watch you on YouTube. That would <laughs> be real, right. That would be real torture for them, wouldn't it, huh? That's right. Uh, That's right. <laughs> uh, you're, you're famous. I made some kind of joke this morning when I was leaving the house about being famous and being on TV, and my wife and daughter didn't think it was very funny, so, you know. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but, okay, so today... Today we're going to be talking about King Omri, who ruled in the ninth century. So uh, again, we're doing these archaeological biographies, but it's extraordinary how much evidence supports the biblical record during this period. So why don't you go ahead and kick it off and introduce our audience to King Omri. Well, before we talk about Omri, we really kind of need to set the stage, the historical context from which he came. And so um, historically, this is a period known as the divided monarchy. So where the, um, the formerly united Hebrew nation split into two kingdoms, um, the northern kingdom of, uh, in the north of Israel, the southern kingdom of Judah, and, um, and Omri was, was a king of the northern kingdom of Israel. And um, he came to power at a time when there was all sorts of instability. Uh, I mean, scripture records this. He, by the way, uh, was a commander in the army, so he didn't have royal blood in him uh, to speak of. He was a commander of the army, and uh, King Elah had reigned for two years, and then he was assassinated in his palace at Terza uh, by his chariot commander Zimri. And so Zimri took the throne for himself. We're told this in 1 Kings 16.10. Zimri's reign only lasted seven days, and then um, people rebelled. And so when word got to the army that Zimri's coup, Zimri had led this coup and had taken over the throne, um, the army made Omri king over Israel, and they immediately turned on Terza, their, their uh, capital city, and besieged it. And uh, Zimri saw that the end was near, so he set the royal palace on fire, burned it down on himself, and Omri took the throne. Now, Omri, when he took the throne, his rule was challenged too, um, because half the people of Israel supported a man named Tibni, the son of Ganath. And uh, but but Omri had an advantage. He had the military behind him, and so because he had the military support, he overcame Tibni, who was slain. He solidified his hold on the throne, and so his reign was from about 885 to 7 uh, 874 BC. And he brought in this period of stability to um, to Israel. And so um, he came in at this time where, I mean, you think of that's three different kings and a fourth challenger within a very short period of yeah. time before Omri finally came to the throne. And he solidified things for several generations um, as, as king of, of Israel. Yeah, you know, it's interesting, this uh, sort of, uh, you know, uh, coup, uh, murder, uh, political uh, seizure of power, you know, all the stuff of the human condition, Israel was no different, even though this is God's people that he's chosen to bring out of the world. They're, they're so much like the world, they're almost, there's almost no distinction between them and the world, you know, and it's part of the Old Testament story and why God sends Jesus, because, uh, you know, it, it proves the unfaithfulness of man, even covenant, the covenant people of God. So uh, that's a great overview. We want to encourage people to go to 1 Kings 16 and just sort of look that over as they're watching the show, uh, have their Bible with them. So let's, let's talk a little bit more about Omri. Let's uh, zero in on that. You mentioned here, you're going to be mentioning 12. There's 12 verses that mention his reign, and that's it. So, uh, but, but it's significant, and we have a lot of archaeology related to his life. Yeah, it's interesting. One of the most powerful kings of Israel, we know this from history and from archaeology, and he gets what 12 verses in Scripture. That's all he gets. They pretty much um, talk about um, how he came to power and how he built a new 
um, built a new uh, capital city. Um, even though he was a powerful king politically, he was a very wicked king spiritually. And so his his record in Scripture in 1 Kings 16 reads this way. In the 31st year of Asa, king of Judah, Omri began to reign in Israel, and he reigned for 12 years. Six years he reigned at Terza. Then he bought the hill of Samaria from Shemer for two talents of silver, and he fortified the hill, and he called the name of that city that he built Samaria, after the name of Shemer, the owner of the hill. And Omri did evil that was uh, did what was evil in the sight of the Lord, and he did more evil than all who were before him, for he walked in the ways of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, that was the first uh, wicked king of Israel, and, and in the sins that he made Israel to sin too, provoking the Lord, the God of Israel, to anger by their idols. Now, this is really interesting when you think about it. It notes in this passage that the God, Yahweh, is the God of Israel. But Israel is going after other gods, worshiping other gods, and their king, Omri, is leading them in that. And and this is really interesting when you consider that the most powerful king of Israel, one of the most powerful kings, if not the most powerful king, um, only gets 12 verses. Famous king, successful king solidifies the kingdom um, during a very tumultuous period in the history of Israel, and the Bible says actually very little about his reign. You see, it's, in the view of the biblical writers, as inspired by God, it really didn't matter how much political success you had if you turned away from God. And that's the record that we see with Omri and his reign. Yeah, you know, it's interesting, this verb that's constantly used in the translations, provoking the Lord God to anger. You know, it's just this constant refrain throughout this period of time, you know, just, you know, using a human analogy, pushing buttons, you know what I mean? Just just provoking the Lord into bringing judgment upon them. Brian, we have about a minute left in this segment. Maybe you could quickly just give a, a clarification of why he reigned in Terza and then Samaria. Maybe just give a quick explanation for the audience who's unfamiliar with that. Sure. Well, unlike Judah that had its capital in Jerusalem, and it that was where the capital was in Jerusalem for, for uh, most of Judah's um, existence, in Israel, the capital moved from place to place. And so it was in Terza. And we're not told why Omri decided he wanted to move it to a new location, but he did. And so after about six years in Terza, um, he moved it to this other place, Samaria. And so we're going to talk about how when you go to Terza, the site that's identified as Terza, we see evidence of a monumental palatial type structure. And then, of course, when we go to Samaria, we see the same thing. And so for whatever reason, Omri decided he wanted to move it. He found this other place that I guess he thought was maybe more defensible, right. a better location, and decided he was going to move it there. Very good. Very good. Okay, well, with that word, folks, uh, please don't go away. We're talking about King Omri, king of the northern kingdom of Israel in the ninth century B.C. We'll be right back. In a culture of intense Bible-denying skepticism, Associates for Biblical Research exists to strengthen followers of Jesus by affirming the authority of the Bible. Our archaeological fieldwork and original research form a strong foundation in upholding the reliability of the Scriptures. For students or anyone asking if they can really trust the Bible, please visit our website and partner with us by joining our prayer team or financially supporting this ministry. And thank you for standing with us. Hi, welcome back to Digging for Truth. I'm your co-host, Henry Smith, and I'm here today with Pastor Brian Window, who's an ABR staff member, uh, who's uh, been on a number of shows with us talking about archaeological discoveries related to the Bible. Today, we're talking about King Omri of the Northern Kingdom of Israel. Now, Brian, we picked, off, uh, picked up on our last segment talking about uh, the switch of capitals from Terza to Samaria in the Northern Kingdom, and this was done under the reign of Omri. You can pick it up from there, and let's talk about the archaeology related to um, those two sites. Well, when we go to Terza, Terza has been identified um, as Tel El Farar, uh, and and it's a, an interesting site. It, it, when we go there, we find that there is evidence of 
um, of a rain there of uh, of excavations um, that were done there have revealed that there was a palatial structure, a stratum that I, that was destroyed by fire, just like the Bible says. It was excavated um, from 1946 to 1960 under the direction of Roland DeVoe from the uh, French School of Biblical Archaeology. And, um, and stratum uh, 7B is the stratum that dates to the reign of King Omri, and we find evidence of destruction by fire there. Now remember, um, it was Zimri who was the king for seven days before then who burned the palace down upon himself, killing himself. And it appears that Omri started to rebuild that particular palace. Dr. Bryant Wood from ABR has looked at the excavation reports and he summarized what they found at Terza this way. He said the main building consisted of a central courtyard surrounded by three large rooms. The walls were faced with stone on both sides and were reinforced on the front and on the corners. The structure was well built using fine dressed masonry, some of which was finished with a boss, a smoothed area on the edges. The stone's oblique dressings resembled that of the masonry that was used at the palace in Samaria, which was also, of course, we know constructed by Omri. Strangely enough, the building was never finished. Construction seems to have been abruptly halted there. There were abandoned building materials, partly dressed stones, and it appears that the construction was discontinued partway through Omri's reign when he began to work on uh, Samaria. So we look at this evidence and we go, okay, so what would we um, see here? Um, we would see that um, he reigned at Terza for six years, we're told, and it appears that he started rebuilding the palace that had been destroyed by fire. And for some reason, halfway through said, mm, nope, I think I want to go to Samaria, purchase some property there and started building there. But we come to Terza, uh, Tel El Fara, and we see evidence of a palatial type structure destroyed by fire, starting to rebuild. All of yeah. the pieces fit what we would think we would see um, from that particular um, site. Now, it's interesting, in 2017, there were some new excavations that started up. I think they only okay. have one or two seasons uh, at that site, so we'll see what else comes um, through the excavations there. You know, it's interesting, Brian. You know, you and I have talked about this, and we talk about this on the show all the time, For but for our listeners who may be new, new audience members, again, we have here very precise correlations between the biblical text and the archaeological evidence, which evidence is eyewitness testimony, this sudden switch. And you're going to talk about Samaria in a moment. But, it, but what we find in the archaeology is consistent with what the Bible is saying. After the sixth year, he goes and builds a, a capital somewhere else. Again, evidence not of stories being invented or being written later or being expanded upon, but a, an accuracy that's very, very technically precise. Now, Let's move to Samaria, Brian. I'd love for you to talk about that because that was the most well-known capital of the Northern Kingdom of Israel. And we just talked about the switch. Let's talk about the switch to Samaria. Samaria is a very interesting site because unlike a lot of ancient sites in Israel that were built over by modern cities, and it's very hard to, um, to go see them, um, Samaria was never built over by a modern city. Now, unfortunately, it was built over by Herod the Great, who built a built a, a temple right on the summit, right where the um, the palace would have been on the Acropolis. But um, it's it's interesting to see that when you when you go there, you can see all sorts of things, and even still, the remains of the palace that he built. It was excavated from 1908 to 1910 by the Harvard Expedition, and they focused on the highest part of the hill because that was the Acropolis. That was where the palace would have been. And they discovered this palatial structure right at the pinnacle that was identified. They identified it as the Palace of Omri. And they, they wrote this in their findings. They said the oldest part, the core structure, was built on the pinnacle of the rock made by cutting away the sides of the hill to form an artificial scarp from one to two meters high all around the summit. And the stones were roughly dressed massive blocks. Um, the walls were thick and heavy, and it's assigned to Omri because it's the earliest of the three structures um, in the Israelite palace. And so they look at it and they say, well, we have this ancient text that tells us that this king built a palace there. We go to the site, we find a palace at the site, just as the Bible says, that dates right to that particular um, time frame. 
Dr. Norma Franklin, who's also uh, excavated there, she um, wrote um, that the original extent of the palace building is unknown, but it's it's about 80 by 150 meters long and may would have um, extended possibly even farther than that. But lots of it was eradicated by the later Herodian and, and Roman buildings at the site. So his palace was this large courtyard. It had these smaller buildings around that were later expanded and renovated by his son Ahab. Remember, we talked about Ahab um, uh, a little while ago when we did our, our episode on Ahab and the and those famous Samaria ivories that were there. And so we go to Samaria and we find this royal complex. Now, we do need to note Samaria is is called a city. It was fortified, but it's not a city like we often think of cities. Uh, Ron Tappy notes that throughout its existence, Samaria remained fairly small in size. It was a royal compound rather than a multifaceted city, and it remained that way until the fall of Israel in 721, when, of course, Assyria came and wiped them out off the face of the map. Yeah, so the, the translation and the use of the word city in the Old Testament kind of has a broad connotation to it, and we have to... The archaeology actually helps us to conceptualize what the term, its usage, and sort of the range of what the term is. It would have been different than Jerusalem, which obviously had civilians living there and so on, different, a little bit different than at Samaria, where it was, as you said, primarily a place for the king and his uh, uh, royalty and his, uh, the people that work for him. So friends, uh, we're, we're sitting here, we're, we're having a great time talking with Brian Wendell, talking about King Omri. We hope that you're enjoying this episode of Digging for Truth. And with that word, we'll be right back after a brief message. Bible in Spade is a non-technical quarterly publication published by the Associates for Biblical Research, written from a scholarly and conservative viewpoint. Bible in Spade supports the inerrancy of the biblical record and is a must-read for both the serious Bible student and anyone asking if they can really trust the Bible. Archaeological evidence, properly interpreted, upholding the history of the Bible. Subscribe today at BibleArchaeology.org. Hi, welcome back to Digging for Truth. I'm your co-host, Henry Smith. And uh, on Digging for Truth, we love talking about archaeological discoveries and evidence that supports the reliability of the Bible. We're here with Brian Wendell, pastor, ABR staff member, and great friend of the ABR ministry. Uh, Brian, we've been talking about Omri today, King Omri of Israel. And now we're going to talk, we had cool evidence in the first two segments, but now we're going to talk about inscriptions. And the first one that you're going to talk about is the Moabite stone, uh, which you're going to tell the audience why that's important. Yeah, one of the most famous discoveries in all of archaeology is the Moabite stone, also known as the Misha inscription. And um, in it, it describes, it's the, the writing of uh, a Moabite king, Misha, who describes his accomplishment. But he mentions Omri, king of Israel, and how Omri had expanded his territory, the kingdom of Israel, and subjugated Moab for a period of time before Misha brags of, about how he had thrown off Israel's oppression. And uh, the Moabite stone reads this way. I'll just read you some of the translations so the viewers can, can hear. This is what the Moabite stone says. It says, Omri was the king of Israel, and he oppressed Moab for many days. For Chemosh, or Chemosh, was angry with the land. And his son succeeded him, and he said, I too will oppress Moab. And in my days he did so, but I looked on him and on his house, and Israel has gone to ruin. Yes, it's gone to ruin forever. So Misha claims to be the one who has wiped um, Israel off, but that's what a lot of kings claimed. He never did that, but it does appear that he threw off the Israelite yes. oppression. He goes on to write, Omri has taken possession of the whole land, of uh, all of our land. He lived there in his days, and half the days of his son, 40 years, but Chemosh returned it to me in my days. And so he attributes his ability to throw off Israelite oppression to his god, uh, the Momite god Chemosh. So that's one of the very famous inscriptions. There's another famous inscription that mentions Omri as well. That's the Black Obelisk of Shalmanazar III. Omri is mentioned on it. Now, it's very famous for the fact that it seems to depict Jehu, 
um, a tribute brought by Jehu, the king of Israel, a later king. And um, on it, in cuneiform, it says, uh, it calls Jehu the son of Omri. Now, Jehu wasn't the literal son of Omri. That's a phrase that's often used in ancient Near Eastern inscriptions to mean the successor. And so he was the successor to the Omri dynasty and not the son in the literal sense. But it, again, mentions Omri. And, and, and he, even later, we have um, inscriptions from tiglath Pileser III in his annals. So 100 years after Omri reigned, it's still Israel is still referred to in Assyrian inscriptions uh, by the phrase bit humurai, uh, the Omri land, literally. So so 100 years after Omri had reigned, yeah. the Assyrians are still calling Israel Omri land in all of their inscriptions. Even when they deal with other kings, they say, we went, we invaded Omri land. And so it's interesting. We see all of these inscriptions testify to Omri's, first of all, his historicity, but second of all, how... Um, influential his kingdom was and how it expanded. Yeah, that's an excellent survey. So uh, I, I will add a couple of thoughts for our audience just to uh, to encourage them to investigate further. We have articles on our website on the Mesha Steel and the Moabite Stone. If you visit our website, you can find out more about it. There's tons of stuff that intersects with the Bible on the Moabite Stone. Uh, an anecdote about the Moabite Stone, those who saw the picture uh, noticed that it was cracked. That was because the Bedouin uh, smashed it when they found out that Western archaeologists thought it was worth some uh, money, and they wanted to get more money, so they broke it into pieces thinking they would get more. Kind of crazy, but, you know, I guess it makes sense if you want to get money for some rock that's worthless to you. Uh, and then the last comment I'll add, Brian, and I'm sorry, I'm not trying to steal your thunder here, just a couple of thoughts for the audience. Uh, love the picture of Jehu, actually hate it, too, because he's bowing down to the wicked king of Assyria. There it is, an actual image of a king of Israel, but the tragedy of it, he's bowing down uh, before him. Um, so Brian, what a fantastic survey you just gave. Let's uh, shift a little bit though. Um, what You always do a great job of, well, again, re-emphasizing why is this important and what, what can we learn from uh, the lessons of Omri? Well, I think there are three things. First of all, um, when I look at archaeology, and, and Henry, you and I love archaeology, and we love the way that it, that it affirms Scripture. And, and so when we look at Omri, we see um, his historicity that is uh, attested by multiple inscriptions. You know, some people, when they read the Bible, I think they read of these kings of Israel or kings of Judah, and they almost think of them like the kings of Gondor or the kings of Rohan from the Lord of the Rings. Good stories, but mythical or legendary. But when it comes to archaeology, we see that these were real people who lived at a real place and time, just as the Bible describes. But archaeology also illuminates um, scripture, particularly with the reign of Omri. Remember, he's only given 12 verses in scripture, and so we don't have a lot about his reign. And so when we go to archaeology and we can see inscriptions that talk about his, him expanding his empire, we can, we can see how he um, built his new um, city at Samaria. It helps us understand his world a little better, and it helps illuminate scripture. I mean, we only have these 12 verses. The Bible says that that all of his um, all of his reign and the other events were recorded in another ancient book called The Annals of the Kings of Israel, but we don't have that anymore. We just have these, these little glimpses, and so archaeology helps fill in the gaps for us. But you know, I think there's also a warning, and this is where we really make it personal. It's a warning that those who want to um, seek power and prestige and wealth, people like Omri. Now, most of us aren't ever going to get to the point where we are kings uh, of any nation. Right. But but we right. still, even in our world, don't we crave those things, power and wealth and prestige? And, and this is a good warning that, that we can't be evil like Omri was. It, we need to worship the one true God. Yeah. And that was his, that was his downfall. I mean, to think about it, Omri never found forgiveness. Even though God was the God of Israel, he never turned to him, and he never found repentance through faith. And, and may that not be true of us today. Yeah, well, Let's that's, take that as a warning. That's a, that's a good word, Brian, it is, and it is a warning, and it's a, it's a tragedy. But uh, we want to thank you first uh, and foremost, Brian, for always uh, putting so much into the show and for being here today to share about King Omri. 
Great to have you on the show. Thanks. Friends, I just want to uh, encourage you with Brian's words. Um, let's draw ourselves closer to Christ. And those of you who don't know him, we, we pray that you'll reach out to him, uh, asking for the forgiveness of sins and reconciliation to a just and holy God. We thank you for joining us today for Digging for Truth.